The answer to a modern riddle. Bigfoot or a heavy foot, he leaves a deep crack in the ground. May lie with America's first inhabitants. There is some kind of creature out there that is a guardian to all of the Native American people. Do ancient drawings hold the first proof? This is Harry Man. And do strange howls suggest the creature still walks the earth? We're looking then at the target frequencies. There was some howling sounds. As the evidence mounts, just got so angry, I start breaking those limbs. Monster Quest launches expeditions deep into the heart of tribal territory. The Yurok Reservation runs for a mile up each side of the river. That's the richest zone for Sasquatches. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The Pacific Northwest was home to Native Americans long before the Europeans settled here. The lush landscape and abundant wildlife have sustained the Native American culture for thousands of years. But according to legend, there is something else living here, a large, hairy beast known to many Native Americans as Hairy Man. It was long as our boat. Taller than a ceiling, that wide. These two big eyes looking at me. It was huge. It wasn't no bear. It was big. Even when he was squatted down, washing his hands, it was still darn near as tall as I was. Eyewitnesses describe the hairy man as similar in proportion to humans, only much larger, with heights ranging up to nine feet tall. It is overwhelmingly muscular, with some reports describing a creature that easily hurls large rocks. The creature is covered in coarse, dark hair and has piercing eyes. The history of what many tribes call Hairy Man is documented in stories handed down through the generations. David Severns is a member of the Yurok tribe and recounts the story that he grew up with. There was a time we believe, I believe, that we lived in harmony with the animals. We had this communication abilities with them. And then some say that when man started to get thinking he was better than the animals, well, the animals quit talking to us and quit having anything to do with us. Including the creature many people know today as Bigfoot. My grandma kind of referred to him as an ancient people, not as an animal, per se, a dog, a, or any other animal, but like us, but just choose not to live amongst us because the way we act. Native American legend tells of a peaceful creature, as long as it is left alone. We're told here to let them be because they're here. And if you don't bother them, they won't bother you. Yurok tribe member Margaret Carlson also tells of a more threatening side to the beast. We're taught not to look at them directly in the face because they can kill you if they want to. While stories of a Bigfoot-like creature abound in the Native American culture, there may also be archaeological proof that it, in fact, did exist, at least at one time. The Hairy Man pictographs have many elements to them. Kathy Moskowitz-Strain is an archaeologist and anthropologist who has worked with the United States Forest Service for 18 years. Strain manages archaeological and tribal artifacts within California and consequently works very closely with the tribal community. Moskowitz Strain has renderings of actual Native American pictographs that may contain a bombshell, one of the earliest records of Bigfoot. The Tule River Indians call Hairy Man, and they have a traditional name for him as Maya Dektek, and that means Hairy Man. Hairy Man, the father, who's about eight foot tall, then over to his right, you have a, a female mother Bigfoot and you have a baby Bigfoot that's right underneath her hand. The pictographs were cataloged on the Tule River Indian Reservation near an ancient village in California. Their age predates the arrival of European settlers by at least 500 years. We know that you put villages where rock art already was. So they're like the villagers would be protecting that rock art. We know this is a very important place. The artifacts from the village are about a thousand years old. So we know it's probably a little older than that. 
Pictures of a hairy creature, thousands of years old. Moskowitz Strain points out that pictographs will sometimes show known animals next to the hairy man. Does this mean Native Americans were not drawing a mythical beast, but like the coyote and eagle, something they actually saw? And they incorporate it just like you would eagle or coyote or any other animal into their traditional stories, into their artwork, into their basketry, because it was a part of what they saw all the time. And so science, I believe, should recognize that and think, well, maybe this isn't just a myth. The images are life-sized and are amazingly detailed. They range from four feet to over eight feet tall. So they're very unique in the sense of what they're representing. Not only are they representing a traditional story, but they're representing true to size, this animal that we call Bigfoot. And, and the tribe themselves recognize it as Bigfoot. The names of the creature across the country vary from tribe to tribe. Stickman, Basket Woman, Yayali. Yet descriptions are remarkably similar, despite the large distances between tribes distances that would have made it difficult, if not impossible, to share information about the creature. How is it that he shares all the same characteristics and, and be imaginary? It doesn't make any sense to me. Usually myth and legends have some reality behind them. Esteban Sarmiento is a primatologist with over 30 years experience studying primates in the wild. He is open to the possibility that there may be some truth to the legends. Maybe these things at one time were real. And the reported elusive nature of the beast is not unlike primates known today. Many primates are cryptic, uh, and, and that means uh, that they have an ability to hide. So when you walk, say, in a forest, they're all hiding, looking at you, and waiting for you to get to a point where if they feel you're dangerous, they're going to come out. However, Sarmiento suggests that the evidence may not currently support Bigfoot's existence. It'd be very unlikely that they wouldn't have bumped into its remains, either a feces, hair, or skeletal. And yet, throughout history, people have continued to report encounters, like Arvada Fisher's experience back in 1976. <laughs> And all day long, I heard this sound. It was a, such anguish, a scream that was way downstream. Arvada Fisher is a member of the Northern Sierra Miwok tribe near Sonora, California. She describes a terrifying evening while camping with her husband in Northern California. And I had this feeling something is watching me. So I leaned back like that with the flashlight in my mouth and I see two eyes up real high. And in my mind, I'm trying to think, I don't remember an embankment over there during the day where something would be standing that high. But it wasn't until later that night that she and her husband got a good look at what had been watching her. I looked like that, and you could see the whole outline of Yaya Lee. He was like this, just standing there, looking right at us, like 15, 16 feet away from our camp. At that time, the dogs caught its scent. And the dogs come running across, and it just got so angry, it started breaking those limbs. It was like 14 feet up in the air, it was breaking those limbs off. And we're not talking little bitty limbs. When we examined it, they were big limbs. In my way of thinking, it seemed that uh, it was upset because the logging was going on, and it disrupted its habitat. It is a common belief among many Native American tribes that Bigfoot is a guardian of the earth. Others say that, at the very least, the creature could be a real animal trying to survive in a diminishing range. I, I really believe that there was a Bigfoot about 50 yards away uh, in the brush. In 2007, state wildlife veterinarian Dr. Briggs Hall had his own mysterious encounter. Last fall, I was coming out of a trail up here in September and at night by myself. 
and I heard two loud whoops just across the ravine from me. And so I, I whooped back. Whoop! Whoop! I waited, heard nothing. And then because it was dark, I scooted on down the trail. As a big game veterinarian for the state of Washington for 14 years, Dr. Hall is very familiar with the native wildlife in the area. There's no animal up here that whoops. I mean, that's, that's a primate, that's primate behavior. Hall's personal experience leads him to believe there may be something to the Bigfoot stories. I don't know how anybody can rule out the possibility that there could be a Bigfoot. I mean, there are so many sightings, there are so many uh, people who hear unusual sounds in the forest and things like that, that for someone to just absolutely rule it out, uh, I, I, I think we need to keep an open mind. Hull's desire for answers drives his return to the location where he heard the sounds in 2007. It is here in the Suwato River Valley in Washington State, only 70 miles from Seattle, that Monster Quest will launch the first of two expeditions. Briggs Hall will travel deep into the forest in search of tracks and set up baited game camera traps. Experts will analyze purported Bigfoot sounds recorded across the country, while another expedition will use those sounds to attract Bigfoot on the banks of the Klamath River, 275 miles north of San Francisco in Northern California. The Yurok Reservation extends a mile on each side of the river and has a long history with Bigfoot sightings. That's the richest zone for uh, Sasquatches. The confluences of those major drainages that come in when they hit the rivers, those big creeks that come in. The Yurok tribe has granted experienced Bigfoot researchers Jim Fay and Cliff Barrickman access to the remote location a rare opportunity to explore an area previously off limits to Bigfoot researchers. Tonight, we're gonna go up to uh, Pequon River drainage where it empties into the Klamath. And uh, we're gonna hit Pequon and Blue Creek and a couple other larger drainages all the way down the river. The plan is to position the boat upriver and at nightfall, let the heavy current carry the boat quietly downstream while broadcasting supposed Bigfoot calls to elicit a response. They will record any return calls with digital audio recorders fed by parabolic microphones, which are able to gather sounds from great distances. In addition, they will monitor the shoreline with a thermal imaging camera to capture any movement prompted by the sounds. Uh, we're gonna call blast up the valleys and stay put for a few and listen real hard. And if we don't get a response in say half hour, 45 minutes, we are going to, without the motor, quietly drift down the Klamath River uh, using the thermal imagers to scan the shorelines for any signs of large mammals and listen in really close for responses with the recorders running. I don't think that's ever been done before. If Bigfoot is hiding under the cover of darkness, their sensitive equipment will expose him. Maneuvering the boat through the treacherous Klamath current are Yurok tribesmen Peter Thompson and Larry Walker. You got rocks, you got snags in the river. I mean, you hit a bank, you can get pushed sideways and sucked down. Depends how strong the current is, because there's some spots on the river where it's really strong current. Run the jet boat on the river, it's a skill in itself. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. A lot of things in the wintertime come down, especially when it's high water. You would get something sucked up in your jet, it'll, you're done. I mean, then you're, hopefully you can get it out in time before you run into the rocks. The expedition begins by heading upstream, taking care to note any outcroppings or disturbances in the water to avoid on the return trip. With a clear night and a bright moon, the weather is on their side, but the river will prove to be a formidable challenge. As soon as I heard the rocks starting to scratch the bottom of the boat, I knew he was in trouble. In 2001, Bigfoot researchers Jim Fay and John Freitas 
were call blasting in an attempt to generate a Bigfoot response. They were using a call allegedly of a Bigfoot recorded in Ohio in 1994. Frieda stayed in his vehicle to signal the person operating the call blasting device. All I had was a two-way radio with the people up on the hill that were watching me with a uh, night vision scope. Faye was observing from a nearby hill. We're just looking through the scope, looking back and forth, looking back and forth. So I didn't have any communication back with the guy that was actually doing the call blasting. So just prior to leaving, I said, when I hit my brake lights, that means give a call blast. Right next to the truck where this big burnt out, looked like an old growth burnt out stump, just stands up and walks into the tree line. And I hear something off to my left. At first I thought it was a bear. I thought it was a bear. It was a big crunching, branches breaking, heavy, heavy, heavy footfalls. And I hear some grunting and growling. And that's when I hear up on the hill, they say, John, that thing is looking right at you. You can't see it. And I'm getting a little nervous, a little scared while we're getting further in this. My heart's going a little faster. I have no protection at all. I start my car. I'm ready to bail out of there because this thing is getting closer and it seems to be more aggressive. So I back it up a little bit and I hit the brake. Of course, that's a signal the sound, the sound blast. That thing goes off. I go forward, I hit the brake again, the sound goes off again. He's thinking that I'm just saying, go ahead with the sounds. This thing is still next to me, it's not scaring it off. The night ended when the creature eventually disappeared into the forest, leaving no sign. But the night has just begun for Jim Fay and Cliff Barrickman. The team is deep in the Yurok Reservation, where few outsiders have been permitted to go. They have completed the journey upriver and are about to begin call blasting. We're at Tektok Creek on the Klamath River, and we're blasting Sasquatch calls and hoping we get a call back or a visit. This is the call they will be using. Thought to be a Sasquatch call, its exact origins are unknown. To capture any responses to the calls, Barrickman is armed with a parabolic microphone. Parabolic microphones essentially act like a big telescope for noise. Um, they focus the noise. So you have all this noise focused down to one point which the microphone is, is recording. To detect any physical movement along the shoreline, they are also equipped with a thermal imaging camera, which is able to detect and record sources of heat in the darkness. Faye scans the river's edge, searching for any signs of life. Yeah, we've gotten good responses up here before. And that uh, incident Freitas and I had was just a few miles up that ridge up that way. As they make their way downriver to the next point, each member of the team is on the lookout, either for signs of Bigfoot or for hazardous conditions on the river. The Klamath River in Northern California has been the lifeline for Native Americans for centuries. The banks of the bountiful waters attract both man and beast, including the one known as Hairy Man. In August of 1995, Yurok tribal member Willard Carlson Jr. was fishing on the Klamath River when he found himself the target of rocks being thrown from a distance. It was, it was huge, it wasn't no bear. Something across the river was throwing some large stones, called like a river bar rock, you know, probably this huge. It's thrown with such great force from a great distance. Um, they landed in the water with such great force, it sounded like they would hit the bottom and hit another rock. And I don't have no gun. And so I started getting my boat, and whatever it was, it went ahead and kind of growled. And, he, and it turned away and walked up the hill. You could just hear crunch, crunch, 
flying through the brush. While Carlson never saw the creature, he knows that whatever it was had to be large enough and strong enough to throw a boulder the size of a basketball over 60 feet. And it did not want Carlson in its territory. Rock throwing, experts say, is a technique used by great apes. It's a characteristic of, of great apes to be able to throw, you know, not just, you know, a short, spastic throw, but pretty good distances, a, a decent amount of weight. It will throw a rock at you out of aggression. It will drop things on you out of aggression. It could be a defense, not necessarily an aggression that I'm going to go and get you, but an aggression not to come near me. If you come near me, this I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable by yelling and throwing rocks. And it was primate-like yelling that has lured Dr. Briggs Hall back to the Sawattle River Valley. The Sawattle River Valley has a long history of, of Bigfoot activity. Hall is embarking on a search to find evidence of a creature he believed bellowed at him in 2007. Joining Hall is Bill Evans, who is an avid woodsman and a Parks and Recreation Department consultant. We have been uh, doing some hiking in some areas where uh, there's been some sightings of Bigfoot and, and looking those areas over. They are targeting a remote area they believe is the perfect hiding spot for the creature. They plan to set up bait stations that Hall has used successfully in the past to attract other local wildlife. Anything that takes the bait will be captured on infrared trail cameras. Their ultimate goal, photographic proof of Bigfoot's existence. Okay, Briggs, let's go. About three years ago, during a, a severe winter flood, uh, the road going up the valley washed out in four places. And since then, uh, not a lot of people have been able to get up there. With the, the significant decrease in human activity, the chances that, that, that these animals would come down closer to the river uh, probably goes up. Paul and Evans plan to take all-terrain vehicles as far as the terrain will allow before they must abandon them and make the rest of the climb on foot. OK, we got about 12 miles up here to go. There shouldn't be any snow. We should be just fine. So we'll load up and we'll head on up there. After two hours on the trail, they find signs that they are not the only ones who have been here. Pretty obvious no one's been up here. Uh, as, as we can tell from the lack of tracks in the snow and the, all the timber we've had to move out of the way, but look at this. What? Yeah, look at this. Huge imprints here. Monster Quest is going deep into Native American territory, probing ancient legends in search of new evidence of the giant hairy beast said to roam the forests. That's what we would call, it would be a hairy hutte, Bigfoot, heavy foot. Miwok tribal member Tom Carson tells a remarkable story of his encounter with a Bigfoot while out hunting near Lake Tahoe. <laughs> There I am peeking through the brush and, you know, watching my back trail and I could see the brush rattle a little bit there, you know, and something pretty good size was moving it along there. So I'm standing there looking like this and looking like this and all of a sudden I see this brush just part like this and there's just two big eyes looking at me. You know. We make eye to eye contact and this is all of a sudden, I jumped up and I thought, emptied that 30 30 rifle at it. Where it turned around and walked downhill and stood up. And my uncle, he was able to follow me up there. 
And I showed him where it happened, and he said, so you shot and emptied your, um, your shells at this guy, huh? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, if you picked up the shells, and there they were, I'd never pulled a trigger at one time. Face-to-face -face encounters such as Carsoner's are a rarity. Just over the Washington border, Briggs Hall and Bob Evans are hoping they will get a similar opportunity. They are deep in the forests of the Suwato River Valley, tracking huge footprints they discovered in the snow. Could these footprints be evidence Bigfoot is here? I mean, we know when no one's been up here. <laughs> we, just, we just had to push logs out of the way to get here. Those are good-sized tracks. We've seen no evidence of anyone being up here. But you can see it goes all along here. Upon closer inspection, one of the tracks offers an explanation. Has the imprint of a boot? More of a boot, yeah. So if someone had walked by and then it melted out, then I think we, we could get this look. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe somebody walked up here. As they continue on, the route Hall and Evans are traveling proves to be more difficult than anticipated. Encountered way more blowdowns and way more logs in the road. And what, what should have been a 40 minute ride was ended up being several hours with a, quite a bit of difficulty. After finally making camp for the night, the team settles in for a good night's rest. Well, hopefully you've set up camp before in the dark. Took us a little longer, but we got it done. Ate some dinner about 9.30 and sometime got in the rack about uh, 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. Hall and Evans are back on the trail at first light. The pair must now continue the trek on foot. They have a full day ahead. And Hall plans on setting up trail cameras in three different areas. The first in the area he heard the strange whooping sound. What I want to do is I want, I want to go over there and set one of the cameras up on top of that ridge over there. They begin by baiting the area with salmon. So my theory is <laughs> that this has been a really harsh year and those guys probably are down here low feeding because the snow's so deep up above. And I'm thinking that after a, a winter of eating, whatever they eat in the winter, I guess it's just be a lichen and, and salal leaves and bark that this has got to smell pretty good to them. Using tent poles, Hall and Evans suspend the bait high into the trees. So it's got to be higher than a bear can reach. OK, this is good. Give me some line. Once the bait is in place, they position the camera so it focuses directly on the bait. Hall is using a reconics camera system with an advanced imaging capability. The infrared night vision flash is invisible to animals and captures nighttime images with amazing clarity. I have a clear shot of if some, anything that stands underneath the bait. With camera number one in place, the team heads out for their second location. This one will utilize a natural food source in the area for bait. Well, I anticipate that the skunk cabbage will be breaking through up in this area in the next week or two. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful plant. It has broad, bright green leaves and a beautiful yellow flower. A very, very strong odor, hence the name skunk cabbage. The bears focus on it, and Bigfoot is thought to feed on basically the same thing as bears. 15 feet in front of the camera, Hall uses another pungent scent to appeal to the Bigfoot's sense of smell. We hung up some garlic, which has a powerful smell, and, but we're hoping that when animals come into the wetland to feed on the skunk cabbage, that they will pick up uh, the smell of the garlic and be attracted in front of the camera. With the second camera in place, Hall and Evans head for the river to set up camera number three. While Hall is hoping to capture photographic evidence of Bigfoot, audio recordings of sounds believed to belong to the creature are undergoing analysis. We want the biologists to be able to hear it in its best, most accurate recorded way. Greg Stutchman has been an audio forensic analyst for over 16 years. He has received recordings used for call blasting. He has removed any extraneous noises so that the sounds can be sent to a bioacoustics lab for identification. It's 
we have used all the filtering, improved it, attenuated the noise, and in this case there were some, some howling sounds, we can see where on the frequency spectrum those are. So we look at those. The cleaned recordings are now ready for analysis. Is it a known animal or something else? Frequency and pitch are used often synonymously in this particular area of study. Dr. Joe Fox is a professor of biology at Texas A&M University. He will analyze the sounds in an attempt to rule out any known creatures. Fox's initial comparison narrows down the list of possible matches. We came up with a list of about 15 or 16 vocalizations of other animals. We sort of looked at how they corresponded in terms of their physical characteristics to the other sounds that we had. And we narrowed it down to certain files that were similar uh, to animal recordings, animals in the known animals in that area. The frequencies of the three recordings Frida submitted reveal an astonishing similarity to each other. If we look at the purported Bigfoot recordings that we have, as I mentioned earlier, they have very similar um, characteristics in terms of the frequency, around 700 hertz plus or minus 50 hertz, and that's, that's pretty tight in terms of, of the pitch. A curious coincidence. However, further testing is required to reach a conclusion. But as Fox continues his analysis, there will be one recording that even he cannot explain. Long before the Europeans settled in this country, Bigfoot was part of the Native American culture. Stories of the tall, hairy beast were handed down from generation to generation, both in spoken word and in their artistry. Many of those stories held a warning. In a lot of Native American stories, Bigfoot carries a basket just like this on his back, and he goes and finds children that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're away from their family, they're not listening, and he gathers them into the basket. Usually he has sticky hands, and he's picking them up and then just slapping them right in there. And then he takes the basket home, and the children then become his dinner. As a young man, David Severns had his own experience with the hairy man. I could see that dark image moving across and coming up towards me, and I was feeling, I, although I knew, it, I had a good idea what it was right then. And it walked right up the bar, and when it got right straight across from where I was at, it walked right to the water's edge, straight across from me. And by then, I was kind of thinking I'd better reach for my gun. I was getting kind of chicken. What if it decided to come across the river? And I tried to reach for that gun. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was just like petrified. I just couldn't grab that gun. And then I, he squats down. He just squats down like this. And it's, I don't know if he was washing his hands, but he messed around in the water. And when his head's up, it's not like he kneeled down to look at his hands. He's looking at me straight across from him. And then he just stood right back up and then turned around and walked right up that hillside after he crossed through this little puddle of water. He just marched right up that hillside. And I'm not saying like he just boom, boom, boom like a deer does. He, he knew the path that it took to get up that hillside. So I went over and grabbed up my guns and put them in the boat and headed over there. And I walked over to where that water was that it waded through before it climbed the bluff. And I walked around the water and got over on the other side and you see big old, not, I won't say they were footprints, you know, per se the shape of footprints. It looked more like somebody had taken a wet mop or something and blobbed them. But I could see the right where it walked out. It, it was big, you know, it was wet tracks like this. And needless to say, I went back, packed my stuff up and went home. Just upriver from where Severance Encounter took place, Jim Fay and Cliff Barrickman are attempting to lure Bigfoot out of hiding. Beep. 
Their call blasting as yet has not prompted any response. So we're uh, drifting down the Klamath at night with no lights and no motors in high water. It's a little sketchy. It was hard to find anyone willing to do this. It's a little dangerous. And we're just thurming, looking for um, anything hot, anything moving, even anything just hot. It could just be head or a shoulder peeking around a tree or a boulder. And suddenly, movement. But the team quickly discerns it is a herd of cows on the riverbank. Called, this creek right here is called Bear Creek. It's nice and wide and it goes deep back in there. So we're gonna make a call before we float by. That way it has time to echo up the canyon and maybe time we float by at the mouth of the creek, we'll hear a response. As they focus their attention on the shoreline, the unexpected happens. The boat has run aground. Larry starts the engine to motor away from the sandbar, but it is too late. Just keep rocking it. Yeah. Several members of the crew have to jump into the freezing water to free the boat. Switch spots with you so in case we if we get in that current. We're in, go. The boat gets off the gravel bar, but the night on the river ends. The crew desperately needs to get to shore and into warm clothes. 600 miles away, Paul and Evans have arrived at the Suwato River's edge, looking for a suitable location to set up their third and final camera trap. Bill, I like this. Let's go right up and get in this little flat right there. OK. And then I think anything moving up and down the river is uh, going to be coming through that area. They're going to take the easy route. We wanted to take advantage of the air currents that move up and down the river. And uh, the fact that there was a, a lot of animal sign moving across this sandbar uh, suggested to me that this might be a great place to put something. With all three cameras in place, the hardest part of the journey is over. But the waiting begins. So we have, we have a bait up higher and we have a bait down low. Uh, if anything's moving up in, in that area, hopefully they'll pick up the stink of our fish. Paul and Evans will return in three weeks to retrieve the cameras. Will their cameras find proof that a great ape roams these woods? Unusual screams and whoops have long been a hallmark of Bigfoot encounters. Briggs Hall heard them himself in a remote area of the Suwattle River Valley in Washington. There's no animal up here that whoops. I mean, that's, that's a primate, that's primate behavior. 17 days have passed since Evans and Hall baited their camera traps in the hopes of getting proof of the animal. The first thing they notice is that something is missing. Oh, the bait's, bait's gone. gone. Bait's, bait's gone. gone. Let's oh, wow. Hopefully, we got some good pictures here. The salmon used as bait had been hung at a height of 12 feet, seemingly too high for most animals to reach. What then was able to take the bait? Perhaps the cameras have the answer. Counters on the camera register a total of 340 photos. Hall and Evans hike out of the forest as quickly as they can to get back and see what the cameras have captured. The first camera had little activity, but the second was visited by a deer. And the third camera, down by the river, had even more visitors. A raccoon, even a cougar, recognizable by its long tail at the center of the screen. And then this. On the left side of the frame, notice the brown, hairy object. However, a more thorough review of the photos after the image reveals its true identity. The bait they put out was definitely effective in attracting wildlife. This bear showed a persistent interest. Unfortunately, hanging it high in the tree was apparently not enough of an obstacle for the bear. 
The remainder of the photos shows no sign of Bigfoot. But despite the lack of physical evidence, Hall remains firm in his belief. I'm 99% convinced that they exist. I've talked to people who've seen them, and I've had my own experiences. And I'm willing to take the heat because I think at some point, the validity of this animal will be obvious to everybody. Until then, Hall plans to continue the search. I don't know how else you identify Bigfoot unless you can get him on camera somewhere for everyone to see. The results from the river expedition proved to be equally unfruitful. Upon listening to the tapes from that night, the team was not able to distinguish any return calls. But what of the validity of previously recorded calls? For MonsterQuest, Dr. Joe Fox has isolated the sounds of three alleged Bigfoot recordings made in different parts of the country. After comparing the field recordings to other known animals in the area, Fox reports his findings. The first one, in our opinion, was very similar to that of an elk. The second one that we listened to, it sounds like a coyote. It's the third recording that offers the most interesting results. It is our opinion that those recordings don't resemble any recordings of or vocalizations from animals that you might find in that area. Could these be actual recordings of a Bigfoot in the wild? Fox says there is no way to know for certain without seeing the creature. It would help to see this animal vocalizing that sound. But some scientists say the chance of that happening is very unlikely. Given that the country's pretty well explored and no one has ever found any skeletal remains, and these things must have lived and died. Does the best evidence still lie in Native American art dating back a thousand years? Perhaps this was, like the foxes and eagles that they also etched into history, a real animal that did walk the American woods hundreds of years ago, but has now, like so many species, died out. Kathy Moskowitz, who has studied the Native American lore and evidence, agrees, but differs on one critical point. I do not believe that Bigfoot's extinct. He's still out there. There's still signs of him out there. People are still seeing him. Which is perhaps the strongest argument supporting his existence. What are all these people seeing, uh, these vocalizations that are recorded? Bigfoot, I believe, is spirit of the land. There's an old Chinese proverb, and it's, uh, what's the smartest animal in the world? And it's the one that hasn't been discovered by man.